I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, I'm joined by Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr. We're talking about RF interference and how to keep it out of audio circuits, how to fix it on This Week in Radio Tech, next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 107, recorded November 16th, 2011. You're grounded. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Axia Audio and the new Radius IP Audio Console. Feature rich, affordable IP audio consoles from Axia on the web at axiaaudio.com. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hi there, I'm Kirk Harnack, your host for the show. Thanks for joining us. It is this show, this podcast, this netcast, where we talk about really geeky things about radio and radio broadcasting and audio and, and transmitters and, and getting, you know, audio signal out to literally millions of people every day. And that's what the, the radio industry in the U.S. and all around the, the world does. And it's becoming more than than signals over transmitters and over the air. It's, uh, you know, it's becoming a big source of content on the Internet, whether it's a sports or talk or, or uh, more music services. Uh, you know, the radio is, is really in the content creation business. And it's the engineers behind the scenes that help make that happen. I've got two of the best engineers right here with me on the show. Uh, let's first introduce uh, from uh, Manhattan, New York City. It's the best dressed engineer in radio. Well, maybe not this episode. It's Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Hello, Kirk. I'm, I'm trying my best to, uh, to, I can't outdo you tonight. You're in that uh, undisclosed uh, location, <laughs> TV <right>. studio, high <laughs> definition. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, uh, about Chris Tobin and why are you qualified to, to talk to us about uh, broadcast engineering and the geeky stuff we'll talk about on this show. Well, let's see. I've been doing it for about 20 years plus. I've uh, done work with local radio stations, two radio networks, three, no, four different uh, network newsrooms, and uh, multiple uh, satellite earth stations and transmitter facilities, both AM and FM, and have done some television. And now currently I'm uh, running president of a CCS Music Cam, and we manufacture audio and video codecs for broadcasters, both in television and radio and, and other places. So um, things have been good. It's uh, I got a lot, lot going on in the background. Also uh, on the show is our other uh, co-host, and that is Chris Tarr from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Hey, Chris. I am not in an undisclosed location. I am uh, in my bedroom with the frog over here. <laughs> I'm the director of engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Madison and Milwaukee. I'm also a contributing writer to Radio Guide magazine. Uh, I also run the website Virtual Engineer uh, at broadcastengineering.info and many, 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 many other things. Okay. So many that your your wife probably says, Chris, are you going to keep doing all those things? You're going to come home tonight. I seem to recognize her. I think I, when I see her walking down the street, I know who she is. I just don't see her that often, so I'm not sure. <laughs> all right. Hey, well, let's get right into our show, which is brought to you by AxiaAudio.com. And uh, you're welcome to check out their website. Uh, that is my employer, the folks at Telos, Omnia, and Axia. And I appreciate very much their sponsorship. And I and they would appreciate your going to the website and uh, check them out. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Axia and some of the consoles that Axia makes that Leo uses a little bit later on in the show. Here's the subject for this program. It's about the best wiring practices for analog or digital or any, any kind of wiring uh, when you are dealing with a high RF environment. What does that mean? Well, let's say that you're a radio station and you have a transmitter right there on site. Now, that transmitter is putting out a lot of power probably and putting a lot of RF into those wires. Um, if maybe you have uh, occasional RF, like I was just at a radio station this week in Nashville at the studios where they have uh, two high power transmitters on site, but they're for backup. So they're not used all the time. In fact, they're, um, the idea is to never use them. But when they do fire them up, you know, how do you know that the wiring changes oh, you may have made or them? added over the last little uh, bit uh, are, still, are still good? So, uh, Chris Tarr, I'm going to let you take it away at this point and kind of set things up a bit more and get right into the, the subject while they do a little live tease here in the studio. 
Fantastic. Well, you know, RF in, in studios, it happens all the time. We work near transmitters very often, either in the studio or also uh, at the transmitter site. It's everywhere. And especially if you have an AM, you know the noise. You pick up the phone and there's your AM station talking right back to you over the phone. Uh, so what we're going to talk about for a little bit this evening is, is how we combat that. Now, I'm sure, Chris, you've probably run into this many, many, many times in your exploits where you're working in a studio and you're wiring something up and all of a sudden you're here in the radio station. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let me see. How many AM sites have I done that at? Oh, actually, it was an FM site as well. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I've long wire antennas inside the racks have uh, worked really well to pick up the sounds. Things that people talk about or, or, or even forget to talk about sometimes is that uh, things like phone lines, audio wiring, all make really great, excellent AM radio antennas. Uh, we all have it with toasters and, and picking up uh, answering machines and things like that. So what we're going to talk about are some of the things we can do to, to uh, alleviate that problem, to kind of get rid of the RF in, in your plant. And I guess first off, you know, the, the most important thing we need to talk about is grounding. Uh, you know, what What are some, some good grounding tips? Um, you know, you can do anything from, uh, you know, grounding the entire building to grounding racks. Uh, you know, there's a whole gamut of different things you can do. So I guess that's first thing we'll talk about. Uh, what, uh, oh, we're going to, I think we're going to have Tobin come back here in just a second. They're getting him reset. Uh, well, one of the things we can talk about here with uh, with building grounding is, I think of things like Faraday cages. Uh, for example, the, the facility that I have is right at an AM transmitter site, which is not unusual. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, radio studios still, especially AM stations, are still co-located uh, co at their transmitter site. So in the example that we have here, uh, we have a lot of copper in the walls effectively screening around the building which takes care of uh, any kind of RF entering the building, all of that copper screening drains to ground. Uh, so, you know, that's the first step. I think, Chris, you, uh, you, you'll, uh, you've run into things like this, too, where a lot of times uh, almost all of your problems can be figured out uh, just by grounding practices. Oh, absolutely. Hey, uh, absolutely. Uh, one of my transmitter sites, let's see, we uh, had phones. We installed some phones, and the old phones we had were, we'll call them Bell System phones, you know, those real good old clunkers. And uh, we had to change them out. And as a result, uh, <laughs> we went to some newer phones that didn't have the same RFI protection, if you will, radio interference, filtering, and whatnot. And uh, it was interesting. You've got all kinds of music and stuff on the phones, even when you aren't on hold. Uh, but we found that there was a point on the circuit board that if we grounded that one spot to the strap of the, uh, the ground system in the building, all of the, the uh, interfering music on hold just went away. It was, it was the wildest thing. Lift the wire off that spot, came right back. Go to other places on the circuit board on that particular phone, didn't matter. <laughs> Just one location. <laughs> so so well, grounding, grounding is a little experiment, is experimentation as well. Well, I think that's, that's really the first thing you need to do is, is before you start anything else, make sure that your plant is grounded. Because if, if there's any break in that ground anywhere, it doesn't matter where you're going to go, you're going to have those problems. Uh, you know, for example, I, I ran, and, and it doesn't even, you don't even have to be right on the site. Uh, you know, for example, we, uh, one of the stations was at uh, AM station, we had a phone call from a woman who was hearing the radio station on her phone. Went down to check it out, and there was no ground on her phone system coming in, the phone lines. She did, they didn't have a modern DMARC point. Uh, it was an older house, and it had the phone wires coming right into a ceramic block and off to her telephone. So and phone wiring especially makes a great antenna at AM frequencies. So, you know, really the first step is making sure that you've got your building ground done right. And a lot of stuff falls into place after that because then it's just a matter of tying things into your, your station ground. I know, Kirk, we, we, you know, we were talking about this earlier and you brought it up. Uh, you've done some projects too where, uh, you know, you've run into that. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to me like a lot of times you run into older facilities have this problem more often either because they weren't grounded properly in the first place or they're so old that over time, you know, ground straps or things like that tend to tend to break or disappear. Hey, can, can you guys hear me? Am I back with you? Okay, yep. good. Hey, well, I thought actually that if, if you don't mind, I want to actually uh, step backwards a little bit in the conversation and define the problem just just a little bit more. Uh, so then when we talk about what the solutions are, it, it, it would make more sense to those who in the audience who haven't actually experienced these problems before. You know, we mentioned earlier about, you know, okay, you have a high power transmitter uh, on site, either an AM transmitter or an FM transmitter that's close to the studio, close to where you have a lot of wiring and not just wiring, but you have a lot of audio devices. Um, and if you think about the, you know, the world of analog, 
analog audio devices. Okay, you've got um, you know an audio console or a CD player or whatever other uh, devices you may be using that have analog outputs and analog inputs. And so these, uh, uh, then you have wire connecting these these things. In some cases, the wire is pretty short. You know, you've got a CD player next to an audio console, and you know the wire may be two or three feet long or six feet long or so. Uh, but in other cases, you've got and you've got a lot of this in, in, in typical radio stations. A lot of long wires that go from a one studio to a central rack area. Uh, or from the central rack area to a studio, or from one studio to another studio. I mean, here at the, the TV station that I'm at right now, there, there's miles of wiring uh, in the floors, in the ceilings, um, uh, in, in cable conduits and, and stuff. Um, and uh, the, all this wire, as, as you guys alluded to earlier, can act like antennas. Um, it works. Uh, some some signals are easier to pick up than others. But okay, so what? So what if if a wire acts like an antenna? I mean, I can hold a piece of wire in, in my hand here, and sure, it's picking up everything from Russian satellites to uh, cell phone signals uh, to uh, a radio station transmitter a mile away. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I'm, I, it's not hooked to a radio. It's picking this stuff up. What's the problem with wires in radio facilities where there's uh, you know audio equipment? Well, the problem is when um, is when perhaps the input to an audio device, like an input to an audio console, becomes overwhelmed with a high amount of radio frequency, RF signal, that's on that wire. Um, that's probably the one, one of the most common things. Uh, then there's also the problem of uh, an audio input, which in professional applications are typically balanced inputs. So the, the audio uh, amplifier on an input is, is looking for what is the difference between this wire and that wire, you know, the plus wire and the minus wire, as we typically call them. Um, and, and it only amplifies the difference in those two things uh, and, and calls that audio. And typically RF coming in on a wire is, is not a differential signal. It's a common mode signal. It's equally on uh, both the plus and the minus wire. Then there's also the problem, though, of, of RF getting onto the uh, what we like to call ground, ground of a console or the ground of a piece of equipment, a cassette tape machine or a, a CD player or, or an automation, a, um, an audio card on, on, a, uh, on a computer. Um, so if there's a lot of, if, if ground isn't really ground, if ground is really uh, containing a lot of, of uh, radio frequency energy, uh, then this can cause problems to, uh, in and of itself. If, if ground isn't really ground anymore, if, if there's a lot of signal there of some kind. So those, those are some of the ways that, that RF gets onto wires. Now, what problems does that cause? Well, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a, a very much an analog radio station or audio plant, uh, then you, can, you could be very likely to to, to demodulate this, this RF. If it's an AM signal, um, well, that's relatively easy to demodulate. All it takes there is a diode connection, you know, a, two dissimilar metals, you know, uh, uh, s steel and brass together, for example, uh, can act to demodulate that audio. And once that audio is demodulated, well, then any audio circuits that it's connected to, they don't know the difference if it's intended audio or unintended audio. You know, if it's demodulated, it's audio. It's, 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 it's traveling along the same wire as the desired audio. Um, then there's the problem that we come into with, uh, with FM. Uh, FM certainly is, um, I guess, a bit more difficult to demodulate because it's, it's frequency modulated. So just a dissimilar metal connection won't, won't demodulate it. But a lot of times if we have an on-site um, FM transmitter, we're very close to the transmitter, and uh, in, in most any FM transmitter will have a certain amount of what we call AM synchronous noise. So the FM transmitter is behaving a little bit like an AM transmitter as it sweeps frequency up and down and doing its frequency modulation. And that AM synchronous noise basically becomes a you know, 100 megahertz AM radio station that then gets impressed upon uh, all the wiring in, in the station uh, that ground isn't effectively taken care of. Uh, so those are a couple of ways that... that RF can get into things. Uh, with TV stations, you get uh, uh, strong RF onto cables, and you can end up with uh, you know uh, bad-looking bars and, and wiggling in, in the in the TV signal. Now, the digital era has has improved a lot of this and made uh, a lot of equipment less susceptible to 
RF interference uh, that, that you'd be able to hear. Uh, not, necess not necessarily impervious, but a lot less susceptible to it. So anyway, let, let's get back to the, uh, to, to the analog portion now, because that's, I've always found that analog uh, circuitry, analog equipment is, is the most difficult place to get RF out of. And hey, a lot of us have had a, you know, a stereo system at home, and we might live within, uh, you know, half a mile or a mile of, of some transmitter site, and, and you know, you get you get the radio station in, in your in your uh, stereo system, or you've taken a call from a listener who says your radio station comes in my telephone. Uh, well, you know, because the phone company has all these antennas uh, all around your city, they're called phone lines. So, okay, I've kind of set the stage a bit for what the problem is. You know, RF getting impressed upon uh, wiring and in most cases, the problem comes about with analog, uh, analog connections, analog wiring, like microphones, um, or like even uh, uh, he he headphones. We can't be digital everywhere. You know, uh, uh, microphones are inherently analog devices. Uh, our voices are, and headphones are also are, are have analog connections to uh, to their amplifiers, and, and RF can get into those analog connections. So now that I've kind of set that all up, I'm sorry, Chris. Why don't you get, go back to uh, addressing some of, of what I was saying, and and uh, and go on with with your own, and tell us how these solutions you were talking about, the like Faraday cage and 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 shielding and good grounding. What do those things do to reduce or eliminate the the problems that I set up for us? Well, you know, essentially the, the copper and the Faraday cage effectively block those signals from getting into your building and getting onto the wires in the first place. So, you know, if you're talking about a, a transmitter plant, that's generally, in terms of best practices, that's the first thing you do. And, and it, you know, may not be the entire building. It may be building parts of the building where you just have wiring. But, you know, that's the first line of defense. Generally, you take care of that, you're, you're, in, you're in pretty good shape. And what happens is the RF is essentially soaked up by the, the, by the copper Faraday screen and, and grounded out into the ground and stays away from, from your wiring. Now, after that, you may still have some stuff coming in. And this also goes hey, Chris, for... Hey, yeah. I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a great analogy here to explain okay. to folks how a Faraday cage works, okay? Okay, so I am the electronic circuits that are desired to be working, right? Okay. You are the RF. Now we're going to yes. demonstrate how a Faraday cage works. Go right ahead, Chris. <laughs> yeah, they, see, I'm talking, Kirk's not hearing me. That's because he's covering <laughs> his ears with a Faraday cage. Uh, you know, I, 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 for, for an example, you know, to, to show how effective these are, uh, in my building, try walking around with a cell phone inside of my, inside of my studios. Good luck. Uh, I have a real hard time keeping a signal unless you're near a window because effectively any kind of RF trying to get into the building is, is blocked at the, at the wall. Uh, but you are going to have some stuff, some stuff creeping in. Either you don't have that, that, that screening or possibly uh, you, know, you, you can't afford all that copper in a building or you're in an older building where that's not the case. Then you have to give your some other measures, which is getting the RF, or getting the RF off of the copper once it's been on there. And, uh, you know, uh, Chris was kind of alluding to this earlier, things such as, well, jokes and toroids. So um, I know, Chris, you've got some examples of some of the things that, that you can do to, to keep the uh, keep the RF off of the wires. And effectively, we're, we're doing what? We're, we're attenuating the RF, we're blocking the RF on some of these wires? Oh, can't hear you. No audio from Man. Mr. Tope. There we go. Oh, there we the go. Microphone. That's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's a combination of, let's see, um, you're attenuating the RF signal, you're absorbing the RF signal away from the device that's being affected uh, in a bad way, or you're accepting the fact that the RF is on, this, on the wires, but because of the physics of, say, twisted pair wires and the, the difference between balanced and unbalanced connections, you actually can cancel out any of the interference that would be common to both the high and low side of the wires. So depending on the uh, need, the application, yes, you could be attenuating, accepting it, and canceling it out. There's a couple of ways to do it. But toroid cores, or the little ferrite beads, as they're known as, they're made of iron ore. And at different sizes and frequencies, they can be used to attenuate uh, the interference that you're getting from your AM, FM, or TV, or even two-way radio stuff. Let me uh, uh, point out a, a quick, quick example here of a, of a ferrite core, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab my camera here and move it just a bit and point it here at one of the USB cables coming out of my computer. Uh-huh. That lump in the uh, camera cable is a ferrite core. Now, why would there be a ferrite core on a USB cable going to a, to a webcam? 
Oh, it's the uh, clocking signals from the microprocessors, the digital circuits. They actually operate at RF frequencies. You know, yeah. did you ever the the uh, let's see the ferrite the USBs are running at what 700 megahertz? That's an RF frequency. Your CPU operates up to what two gigahertz? It actually, creates an RF signal. So there's a, there's a few things that go on. So, so that that core is there, and it's on. You've not probably noticed it's on a lot of computer cables. A lot of you know video cables uh, for computers and and uh, and other cables have that lump in there, and it's there to uh, help the. Uh, generally speaking, it's there to help keep uh, signals in the computer from from emanating out common mode uh, on that cable. Uh, I wouldn't think it's actually there to keep interference from coming into the computer. Uh, it's more to help the, the computer and the cable as a, as a set uh, meet RFI uh, emission standards. So that if you were Absolutely. to, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, because that cable, that USB cable can act like an antenna. Uh, and ground in the computer isn't necessarily just a fabulous ground. I mean, I, I know that with, uh, you know, this, this Mac right here, um, I, I never can understand grounding of a Mac. You know, the, the metal case will tend to shock you if you're, if, I, if I'm in Europe and it's plugged into 240 volts, I can always feel a little bit of something there on the, uh, on, on the, the unit itself. I, but my point is, well, the, the, the laptop isn't tied to a, a radio station, you know, ground bus bar. Um, uh, so, yeah, so... Yeah, indeed. Let's let's continue to cover toroids and chokes. So a toroid stops, uh, I guess, what you'd call common mode RF movement, right? So you 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 have a cable. Typically, you have a a cable that might have two or more conductors in it, and it might even have a shielding around those conductors. But then we take those conductors and we wrap them. Either we clamp a a toroid on it, or we wrap it through a toroid. This is commonly done in radio stations when you got a bad RF problem. And by wrapping this whole thing through the toroid, you know, one or hopefully several times. Um, we're allowing the differential mode signals to continue. They don't know. The differential mode signal, that is, you know, plus and minus uh, changing phase relative to each other and changing voltage relative to, to each other, they don't know they're going through a toroid. They don't care. They just, you know, they might, you know, think, hey, why am I going around in circles? But they don't know they're going through a toroid. It's the outer part. It's the common mode. It's both wires carrying the same signal in the same phase together, uh, common mode, that would realize, oh, I'm going through a toroid. I don't want to go through a toroid because I have to give up a little bit of energy every time I go through the toroid. And so a toroid stops this common mode um, and, uh, RF signal. And, am I kind of right yeah, on that? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Well, and and common, common mode signals is actually the most common RF problem that we, that we deal with in, in broadcast. And in fact, at home, that's probably a lot of the, the RF that you're dealing with at home is the same kind of thing. A great example is uh, in my car, I had a, uh, a charger uh, that, was, that would put a lot of noise on my uh, car adapter for my iPod. So what did I do? I took it, wrapped it around a toroid a few times, boom, gone. So, uh, you know, same thing with phone line noise. Uh, you know, essentially what you're doing is you're buying a, a, a toroid to, to put along your phone line to eliminate uh, AM broadcast noise. So you'll find that a lot of what you're dealing with in broadcast and even in uh, uh, even at home uh, is, is common mode. And, and you'll most of the time deal with, with toroids. Now, keep in mind, when you're looking at toroids and you're looking at ordering toroids, they have different mixtures of, uh, you know, the ferrite and iron and and that sort of thing, and and they they work at different frequencies. They cancel out different frequencies. So you know you'll buy a different uh, mix of a toroid for AM frequencies than you would for say FM frequencies. So um, you know be sure to do your research when you when you buy buy toroids. But I, I mean I don't know about you guys, but that's that's the most common uh, type of interference that I deal with in terms of of RF uh, in my facilities. Yeah, that so would be true. That I've, I've had that. Well, one Sorry, thing Kirk. I sure noticed is uh, some years ago, gosh, it's been a long time ago, uh, I've, I've uh, bought a couple of um, uh, or been involved with installing a couple of uh, Nautel brand uh, transmitters. And uh, Nautel was always, I thought, pretty good about it, including uh, some accessories that you would need to install the transmitter. And one of the accessories that, that they tended to include are uh, a certain number of toroidal chokes. So... Um, 
uh, I'm, boy, I've received some uh, that were kind of large. And the instruction manual says, hey, run your AC power cord through this a few times and then plug it into the back of this exciter or, or this transmitter. Or when you run 220 volts or whatever into the transmitter, run the, you know, take all, all of them and run them through this toroid a few times and then connect them to the AC power input. Hey, when you bring the RF coax into the transmitter, you know what's going to take the high power out of the transmitter? Uh, run it through this toroid. You know, you're not going to be able to loop it, but put it through there once. Uh, when you bring your audio connections from your audio processor over in the, in the next rack, run it through this, this smaller toroid a few times and then connect it to the audio input on the transmitter. Now, why are they wanting every input and output on the transmitter to go through a toroid first? Well, that's that's for high voltage uh, most of the time. That's for things like lightning and, and that sort of thing, where you want the uh, it's for because of skin effect, and essentially you want that current to uh, be uh, basically uh, to saturate the core of the of the toroid and take it off of whatever's inside. So uh, we see that a lot. Plus, there are some situations where get RF into things like exciters. Uh, cause a lot of problems. Uh, a great example is uh, I had to uh, have an FM co-located with my AM here in Milwaukee. And I, I would say a couple of years ago, I get a phone call from a friend of mine who said, you know, you want to check something out. I I'm listening to you. A couple channels up. I'm hearing a combination of your FM signal and your AM signal. So, mm. uh, you know, I, I, I take a look and, and sure enough, uh, about one and a quarter megahertz up and down, I'm hearing a combination of both stations. Well, my AM station is 150 kilohertz. It was getting to wiring, going to the FM exciter. The FM exciter was taking that, that signal, modulating it, sending it out. Uh, so, you know, we had uh, this, this combination of signals, 1.25 megahertz up and down. So... Uh, you know, the, the way you fix that is you put some toroids around that and uh, took the AM component uh, going into that uh, FM exciter. So that's why they have, uh, you know, Nautel is great about packing toroids uh, by the bag full when they sell a transmitter. And, and you're right, they instruct you to put them on everything. So, uh, uh, so toroids are one way to take care of this, and we understand that toroids will help uh, stop RF, which is common mode, which is the most typical way that this that this is happening. Um, but I've also seen um, another technique where we use some kind of capacitors. Typically, maybe you have an input to an audio console, and you're getting some RF uh, when you bring up that source on the audio console. You're you're hearing some demodulated RF. I understand that you can take um, a small value capacitor and go from each side of that audio feed, the plus and the minus, to a common ground. Uh, so when, when, when we put a capacitor there, what's happening? Mr. Tobin, why don't you take this question? What's happening with this capacitor? Uh, does this affect the audio? Uh, and is this effective at, at uh, reducing the amount of RF going into a circuit where it doesn't belong? Well, the, uh, it reduces the amount of RF going into the circuit. The capacitor arrangement you're talking about, commonly known as a bypass capacitor, uh, it's a low value, typically um, is it like 0.01 microfarads. And the idea behind it is that it, it just bypasses. So it's diverting the RF interference, you call it, uh, to the chassis, to the ground, wherever you have the bypass capacitor. If properly done, the audio should not be impacted because it should, it should pass the audio frequencies, but anything above audio frequencies like the RF signal, it'll bypass. And that's basically what it does. It just it becomes a, a block at the frequencies. The capacitor's value just blocks the, the radio frequencies and bypasses to chassis, uh, or we'll call it chassis ground. And by the way, it, those, those, mm -hmm. those bypass capacitors, we also use those on things, for example, like tower light flashers, when there's RF getting into those as well. Oh my goodness, that's right. There's a there's a prime example of of a really sticky situation. Here you've got let's say an AM tower, and it's got to have lights on it, right? If it's tall enough, so you've got this tower light flasher. Well, now the old ones were mechanical, and they weren't very you know uh, uh, susceptible to RF problems. There was a you know a, a motor and a and a rocker and a mercury switch that went and you know okay that's fine. But nowadays you know, we use solid state flashers, so you got this module that's uh, potted and it's got a flash circuit in there it's typically got what three terminals on there so there's one for the the uh, ac uh, 110 volt neutral and there's one for the the the, the
the source, you know, the hot, and then there's uh, another lead that is that gets flashed. And so the tower lights are hooked to the neutral and the flashed, and the incoming is hooked to the neutral and the, and the hot. Well, this thing is supposed to be mounted on the tower, typically in a box, and uh, with a, uh, oftentimes there's a photo cell right there, too, that runs a, runs a relay and turns the whole contraption on and off. Um, but so you've got all this AC wire going up the tower. And uh, it's going to have plenty of RF on it. Um, uh, now, typically, it's in conduit, but still, it has a lot of RF on it. And this RF can screw with the operation of the solid-state tower flasher. It cares. It's got it's got electronic parts in there. So you're saying that oftentimes you'll see uh, you know some capacitors. I, you know, I've seen these capacitors. In fact, I've seen them blown up. <laughs> when, when lightning hit or, or there's a power surge and these so these capacitors are go from uh, you know an, an AC line to ground to the uh, or to the tower itself to some way to get the differential gone so that there's no RF uh, differential between you know uh, ground and uh, or, or, or the tower itself and the and the AC and what you'll see is if you don't do that, you'll have things like tower lights that are blinking with the modulation or they'll start to blink until the audio goes silent and then shut off. And I, I actually had that situation uh, first time we put in solid state flashers where whenever it was a great silent sensor because whenever there was no audio, tower lights would stop blinking. So I, I worked at I, I worked at I worked at a disco station, and that was perfectly acceptable for the lights to flash with the <laughs> with the music. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so th there's one more technique I want to talk about. Uh, so we've talked about chokes and capacitors a bit. And, and you can choose the right, and there's formulas, you can figure this out. You can choose a capacitor that will have no effect on the audio frequencies, not even the highest audio frequencies, uh, but it will shunt a great deal of the RF to grounds. So the capacitor, you know, is, is like a, a frequency dependent uh, circuit. Um, and, and part of the, the Part of the frequency dependency here, we're talking about the uh, the input impedance of the circuit and and the, and just you know, the the apparent impedance that's going on right there, um, and and some of that may be variable. So you know different value capacitors. We're talking about small capacitors, by the way. You know s several picofarads or you know 0.001 microfarads. We're not talking about you know power supply capacitors here. We're talking about small, typically mica uh, uh, capacitors to do RF bypassing. Uh, but another technique is to use a choke that is in series with the audio. So a choke would be a uh, a, 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 wi a wire wound typically around some kind of a core. It may, it may be an air core, or it may uh, be, uh, be be actually some kind of a of a, uh, a ferrous core. But the idea here is that a choke would uh, let's see a, a choke passes DC just fine. But as the frequency gets higher, the choke impedes the flow of, of electrons or the flow of, of signal uh, through it, depending on the value of the choke. So um, you would choose a choke, and typically these are, these are you know, reasonably small, that would present an impedance to RF, but not an impedance to audio. Now you combine the choke and the capacitor in the right way, um, and then you have an LC circuit. You know, you have a, a, an inductance and a capacitance circuit, which can be very effective at uh, being selective. Uh, that's what we're looking for here. We're wanting to pass analog audio and yet selectively get rid of anything that is you know, higher than the audio frequency. That, that would be RF and shunt that to ground. An LC circuit would, would do that. Chris Tobin, do you have experience in you know, either designing or sizing the, these kind of uh, uh, parts so that they're pretty effective at getting rid of RF? I haven't done it in a while, but yeah, there are formulas that you can use. Um, most equipment today really handles RF very very well. Uh, some of the chokes back in the day, uh, you, you had them in power supplies for some of the transmitters, and you had to sit and sort of do the formula for an LC network and, and uh, you know, cut the wires out, reduce some of the coil. Uh, but for the most part nowadays, you know, everything is pretty, pretty solid. I, I don't know, let me see, uh, I haven't had many instances or, or needs to build an RC or an LC network at all for, uh, for shunting RFI. Isn't it kind of interesting that that here, you know, the three of us engineers in this in this uh, era where we've had a lot of digital in the last few years, um, AES digital and now IP audio over Ethernet digital, we're finding that there's a lot less need to know these techniques to get RF out of stuff. 
Uh, there, there still are occasions where we have to do it. And tell you what, after after a, a, a commercial break from uh, our sponsor, we'll we'll get into that a bit, and then we're going to return to the subject of of grounding and grounding technique for for you know for lightning protection and for keeping RF out of stuff. Right now, I want to take a break and tell you about our sponsor. It's also my employer, and I'm really glad to have them uh, on board as a sponsor. It's Axia Audio. Axia, the uh, inventor of LiveWire. Uh, which is the low latency, uh, basically unbuffered, uh, f uh, uncompressed way to pass uh, beautiful uh, mono, stereo, or even surround audio over uh, over Ethernet IP, you know, standard off-the-shelf Cisco, HP switches, and so forth. And uh, the low buffering, the uh, the low latency, also makes it perfectly usable uh, on the air. Um, you know, one of the, the the challenges to come up to to fix about uh, putting audio over Ethernet IP um, is that if you use a, a, a standards that existed prior like a CobraNet or EtherSound, these are perfectly good standards, but they uh, don't really pay much attention to, uh, the, to the, the, the problem of latency. So when you talk into a microphone, when a disc jockey talks into a microphone and this audio is converted to digital and converted to IP packets, it flies around the network, it gets mixed in a, in a mixer, and then it comes back out through some interface to a disc jockey's headphones. Um, if there's more than about three or four milliseconds of latency there, it sounds weird to the disc jockey. So you've got to have a way to keep the latency very, very low. Well, with, with LiveWire, that's why it's called LiveWire. With LiveWire, the engineers who developed that or de took the standards that existed and uh, added a little bit of timing secret sauce to that, um, they were able to get the latency in a typical radio installation down to under three milliseconds. And that's really critical. That's, that's why folks have come to, the, to us at Axe and say, hey, why don't you guys just use CobraNet? Why don't you use uh, EtherSound? Well, again, they're perfectly good technologies, but they're not designed for talking into a mic and hearing it live and hearing it back in, into your, your, your headphones, your, your earpiece. You've got to have that low latency. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, Axia consoles are what are being used um, at Leo's Twit Network, at the Brick Twit House, and before that at, at, the, uh, at the cottage. Right there is uh, a big honking console. That is the main console uh, for doing most of the productions that they do at the Twit Network. That is an Axia element console. An element can have anywhere from two faders up to uh, 40 faders. Uh, that one has, what, uh, 16, no, 18 faders. 18 faders on that console. That console, by the way, has motorized faders. So uh, if they want to, they can set up a, a profile, which when they load the profile, even uh, zooms the faders up to you know, the levels that they need to be at. So it can be, can be very automated. Um, there's mic processing built into uh, uh, to the console for all the microphones. There's automatic mix minus that is built into the console. So every single one of those faders that needs to provide a back feed to a source, like what I'm hearing right now, I'm getting a mix minus in, in my headset. Uh, it's coming from the Axia console's automatic mix minus capability. Really cool. Folks ask us, how many mix minus buses does it have? How many do you need? It's, they're all virtual. The other uh, console that is at the Brick Twit House is the Radius console. This is a new small eight fader console, and it's in Leo's personal studio. Uh, and well, there it is. Uh, the Radius console is very inexpensive. In fact, it looks like I'm going to be able to afford to buy two of them for my radio stations in American Samoa. Uh, so Leo got one of these. It's all he needed, eight faders uh, in his personal studio. Um, you can have, uh, of course, they're profiles. So you can change the inputs at will. Uh, you can change the inputs uh, on the fly if you need a fader to, to be one thing or you know versus whatever it was. Uh, you can store profiles in there. Um, uh, each fader uh, does have the ability to do a back feed, just like on the big element console. So it's it's a it's a really convenient thing to install. And I got to tell you, installing one of these consoles, uh, the element or, uh, or or the radius, and I should say especially the radius and its big brother, the IQ console. These are quick installs. Uh, maybe your first one will take you a bit longer because you got to figure out, okay, what do I need to program? What do I need to configure? Uh, it's all done by web GUI, by the way. You just browse into it, and, and it's got a web server in there. You just you know make selections and save it. Um, uh, but i tell you what, your second console, your third console that you install really fast. Um, on my console in Cleveland, Mississippi, we have a small element console there at my radio station there. Honest to goodness, swear to God, three and a half hours is how long it took to install that console. The wiring and the configuration on the air in three and a half hours. Hey, it took three and a half days to build the furniture, you know, and, and run the phone lines and such. Uh, the console, really quick. Uh, so with the Reyes advertising, it says, hey, 
take a break and install a radius. Well, that's not really too far from the truth. So uh, check it out on the web. Uh, go to axiaaudio.com. There is the front of the website. Uh, unpack, connect, and showtime. Uh, that's the radius console and its big brother, the IQ. Invite you to check that out, and uh, we'd appreciate it very much if you would. All right, let's get back to okay. our show. Uh, we're uh, on our show right now, Twert 107. We're talking about grounding and RF, uh, wiring audio in a high RF environment. Real, um, real quick, Kirk, I have, yeah. I have a console story for you as you were talking uh -oh. about the, the setup of the console. Uh, I put in, uh, I got, I acquired a used Audio Arts A50 console for my studio in my basement. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm putting it in a couple of weeks ago and I'm getting it all wired up and I have it all running. The, everything's working really well. And what do I do? I lean over to tweak something and spill my water right into it. <laughs> oh! oh, after all this time. Telling the DJs in the studio, no, you know, watch the stuff around the console. What do I do? Spill water right into it. Fortunately, you know, I pulled the plug right away and dried it all out, and 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 it was fine. But uh, you know, all that time harping on people not to spill things. What do I do with the one I have sitting in my basement? Spill water into it. First day. Oh, and and the console was okay, right? After you dried it out, it was fine. Yeah, I had to, okay. I unplugged it and let you know pulled out all the modules and let it dry overnight and. And it was fine, and that's the key. You gotta, you know, kill power to it right away and let it dry. But uh, it's, it seems to be uh, so far no ill effects from the, from the whole event. <laughs> By the way, in the, in the chat room, uh, Web thirty two thirty six says uh, bourbon is actually much worse on electronic equipment. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what water is usually not too bad if, as long as you get the power the power turned off. By the way, that does uh, let me bring up one more really interesting thing. Um, uh, you know, on a console, an audio console, the the point of ingress for liquids is typically those slots where the where the the, the faders are, right? Because the, the there's a slot where this thing has to move back up and down, and and then you go down below that inside the fader, typically a Penny and Giles brand or something. Uh, you know, it's got a slot in the top of it too. Well. Um, uh, my, my brilliant friends and engineers at, at, at Axia uh, found a, uh, a fader that actually enters from the side. So if you spill something into the top of it, I'm not saying it's waterproof, but if you spill something in the top of it, it does not go into the fader. Uh, it, it goes around the fader. Um, and because the, you know, the, the, the tang that you move up and down actually is bent uh, into kind of a C shape and it goes into the side of, of the fader. Brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. Some Japanese company came up with that, and uh, so again, not saying it's waterproof, but uh, it's, it's it it works pretty well. All right, uh, back to uh, keeping RF out of signals. Uh, we kind of covered this analog stuff, and you know, a lot of it. Well, uh, yeah, I've, I've been accused of that being kind of a black magic. Well, there is a, an, an art to kind of understanding where the RF is is the, the the RF energy, the RF interference is getting into. Um, a, uh, a an audio system. Uh, there are engineers who have you know uh, tried and true techniques. Some engineers will tell you ground everything at the racks. Other engineers will say will say ground everything at the source and the destination. And leave it uh, leave the ground unconnected at at, at the uh, at the punch blocks or or at the racks. Well, uh, and, and you know what? There's valid reasons for both things. I remember an Autotronics console uh, brand, their console that no longer exists, uh, but they were in Memphis, and I used to work with them a bit. Uh, they always said never ground. Uh, oh, no, no, they want you to, to ground at the console, ground the shield of the analog wires at the console, but there, that was a separate ground that had a capacitive connection to the, the, the main ground. Other console manufacturers told you don't don't ground the shield at the console. Make sure it's grounded back at the source. And this had to do with the the source impedance was typically low, and the console input impedance was typically very high. And you wanted the the RF to drain uh, out of the the, the, the shield uh, back where the impedance was low. It was it was less likely to get in, into the uh, audio at, at that point. Well, what I'm getting around to um, to explaining is that. In today's world, uh, we have a lot less of this analog RF problem. We have a lot more AES audio and uh, an Ethernet uh, IP audio, uh, which blessings, you know, can really solve RF problems to a large degree. So, um, uh, Chris and, and, and Chris, why don't you guys uh, talk for a little while about RF grounding and what's necessary and what's necessary about getting 
RF out of uh, circuits where you've got AES digital audio. And I'm going to ask you guys to talk about that because in my, I never worked at stations that did a lot of AES. We did very little AES audio. So you guys probably have a lot more experience with that than I do. So what's important with RF and AES? I think I think I'll defer mostly to Chris for this because actually I, I'm with you. I, I actually haven't done a lot of uh, of grounding with digital yet, so I'm still I'm still kind of getting my head around it as well. So I, I know I, I believe Chris, you've done some actually more than some digital wiring, so you probably have a little better uh, insight to this. Uh, yeah, well, you know um, the AES circuit designs in general uh, use a lot of uh, filtering, uh, whether it be capacitive or or inductive. Uh, just by nature of the design of what they have to do because the digital frequencies as we know they're very high frequencies and susceptible to any kind of um, you know uh, noise and uh, what I've also found out is since we've moved into somewhat of a digital world uh, whether it be from IP or just AES audio in general a lot of circuit design now requires because the frequencies that these digital circuits operate at require by default heavy-duty RFI filtering so you know 20 years ago you buy a uh, open real machine and the audio inputs and outputs were basically transformer coupled if that or DC coupled with capacitors and very little filtering because you know not much was going on around it now you've got equipment in environments with PCs running at 2 gigahertz and you know uh, LAN connections running at 10 gigahertz or a thousand gig and you've got RF everywhere so with AES it, it, it's, it's, it's a digital stream so any um, alien noise uh, is, is, is enough to create havoc Analog audio, as we know, is very forgiving. Digital audio is you know, not forgiving at all. So uh, with AES, by design, uh, the circuits, ins and outs, are actually filtered very well. The hard part is making sure the cabling is done right. The source impedance, uh, you know, just don't use any cable. I mean, short distances, like two or three feet, you can get away with some you know, shortcuts if you have to. But anything of consequence, uh, you definitely want to do 110 ohms you know, and, and do it balanced, proper AES. If you do SP diff, which is the consumer version of an AES signal, uh, you, you do need to convert for impedances. It's a different impedance. So, um, you know, it, it, there's some care and feeding required. But AES and RF interference don't go well at all. Uh, it would be the same as, you know, digital video and any kind of noise from, say, a hair dryer uh, nearby and like a video camera. You know, you get those little white specks or, in the case of digital video, dropouts, you know, squares. So one thing that, uh, okay, so AES, um, uh, at least with with in the radio broadcast world, we tend to use XLR connectors and have balanced audio wires, and, and typically that wire is is, is shielded. Um, and because it's balanced, uh, unlike by the way in TV where they used unbalanced, uh, they used a 75 ohm um, uh, unbalanced cable and BNC connectors for AES EBU audio. But in in, in radio, we use you know, this balanced circuitry. And I, I'm given to understand that the the input circuit of of most AES inputs uh, consists of a transformer. Do, do I have that right? Is, is there a transformer yeah, on the yeah, input of AES circuits? Okay. Yeah, well, there's, a there's a transformer. Yeah. Well, a, a transformer is just an absolute godsend when it comes to getting rid of RF, unless the RF is, is, is really, really a high level, uh, because a transformer, by its very nature, only transfers from the primary side of the transformer to the secondary side of the transformer, all it transfers from one to the other is the differential voltage, the differential signal between the, 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 the two conductors. So again, uh, RF typically enters uh, uh, any wiring as common mode. It's common to both conductors in, in phase and amplitude at the same time, uh, or it's on the shield. And so the transformer pretty much ignores anything that is common mode. Now, we also have electronic circuits that have pretty high common mode rejection, um, but a circuit like that still could be, even if it has great common mode rejection, the circuit itself, the whole circuit can be swamped with way too much RF. I mean, okay, I mean, get ridiculous. Imagine putting, you know, a thousand watts of RF onto some little instrumentation amplifier input, and yeah, you're going to blow the thing up. Uh, there's also a point where it'll, you know, end up passing a lot of RF through it. So a, a transformer, though, is just a terrific way to, to break... Uh, uh, to, to, to eliminate ground loops, if, if that's a problem, and to make sure that just the signal of interest gets from one side of the transformer to the other side of the transformer. So that said, that's also the beauty of using um, uh, Ethernet to pass audio, because in, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, up to a 100 
uh, megabit per second connection, you know, 100 base T uh, Ethernet connection, uh, there is also a transformer as part of, actually maybe two transformers, as part of the circuit of, of interfacing the two. Now, there may be other ways to get that done, you know, through, through capacitors or, or, or other ways, but um, uh, I know I've seen uh, some tiny, tiny little transformers as part of an Ethernet connection. Now, I believe when you get up to the gigabit connection with Ethernet, uh, they have to use all the conductors, and uh, it's my understanding that you that you that don't have the transformers anymore. There's, there's some more direct connections there. So the thought is that perhaps gigabit Ethernet connections may not be as RF resistant uh, in a high RF environment as 100 megabit connections are. And there's other ways to get it done, too. I mean, obviously, there's, there's, there's fiber, which is a terrific thing because it doesn't care about RF whatsoever. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it, <laughs> RF just passes right through that fiber and, and, and never, never gets on it. Um, so, Chris, uh, Tar, you are getting ready in, in your neck of the woods within the next, what, year or two. You're going to be putting in some new, new consoles, new audio, new, a new wiring plant. Um, you're going to be doing some digital stuff there. Do you anticipate or do you have any idea what you're going to do to see about uh, keeping away from RF problems there? Uh, yeah, actually, we're, we're going to be breaking ground here uh, in, in the spring, so it's coming sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, our, our, my building now, my facility now, has a very well-designed audio ground system. Uh, we have, uh, at the rack points, we have a bus bar. We do uh, kind of the star grounding where, uh, you know, we have each uh, studio is, is on a ground that's tied together. All the racks are grounded together. So I, I'm imagining that when we build the addition onto the facility for the studios, I uh, will just simply tie into the the grounding system that already. Uh, we will have to put some a lot of copper into the ceiling and the walls uh, around the studios to keep uh, keep the the noise from coming through the walls. But I imagine uh, you know with the racks and the audio to the studios, uh, we'll be the correct grounding system. Excellent. We're right outside of a 5,000 watt AM signal, and I don't have any noise on anything. Hey, uh, Chris Tobin, I would imagine that some of your uh, experience with high RF environments has been when you put, you know, in, in, in New York City, in a big city like that, you typically will have a backup studio, and it may very well be at the transmitter site. Yes, absolutely. And we do practice all types of RF filtering and grounding and shielded twisted pair cable everywhere where you can go. And what's nice is with uh, wiring, uh, if you do twisted pair, Shielded the the twisting the, the twists in the wire help to cancel out any interference. So your added protection could be some toroid filtering connections with RJ45 connectors or XLRs. Uh, but yeah, but another place where there's a lot of RF that you wouldn't think so because it's not an AM site is mm -hmm. at the upper floors of the Empire State Building where the FM TV and lots of two-way radio people transmit from. And oh, of course, you can get interference up there like you wouldn't believe and. It's just the funniest thing because sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I forgot about that. Now, at the, on the upper floors of the Empire State Building, um, you're a long ways from ground Mother Earth ground. You're, you know, 100 stories up or 90 story, whatever it is up. Um, what do you do? It, it, does, is, does ground just become common? Are the, are the transmitter facilities tied together in some way? Are they tied to the building structure? How do you, how do you deal uh, with that? Ground is pretty much tied to the building structure. Uh, in our case, the, the building is, uh, you know, steel girders. It's not a lift slab construction like newer buildings. Uh, you can get a pretty decent ground connection. Uh, and because there's a master antenna system as well for the FMs and some of the television, uh, a lot of the grounding is, is to the building, which seems to work. Uh, it, it proves interesting at times. But, yeah, you think about it, you've got television transmitters. You've got uh, FM transmitters, two-way radio transmitters of many types. And you have those uh, specialized low-power TV transmitters up there. It's it's a challenge at times. If you're not careful, you can once in a while get some nice nice uh, interference, strange-looking stuff, and listening. Yeah, and and all that RF from the Empire State Building itself, and the, and from other nearby buildings, and of course people have cell cell sites and and, and two-way sites on buildings nearby. So I'm, I would imagine that's that could be quite a nightmare up there on the uh, Empire State Building. Um, and uh, luckily, you, you don't have a lot of, yeah, I guess you don't have too much studio gear up there. It's typically audio processors and STL gear and things like that. Um, you know, you, you might have had some analog uh, audio, but hopefully short runs in, in a controlled environment. Oh, absolutely. But in today's equipment, most of the equipment today, um, 
you know, it's well filtered. You know, it, it's it's designed really well. And in, in, uh, if you have interference issues or you know RFI on most standard installations, you've definitely done something wrong. Um, if you're in a high RF environment and you know you're going to be in it, you know, and you have a lot of microphones, stay away from you know condenser mics. Try and stick with uh, you know dynamic, you know, moving coil types and you know that kind of stuff. But if you uh, if you do it right, a lot of the stuff out of the box, you don't have to go too crazy. The interconnection just Good shielded wire. If you're going to do audio cables, you have a quad pair. Uh, you know, there's various manufacturers of it. So you have two twists for each leg of the XLR uh, shield, and then two twists for pin two and pin three. So that in itself gives you a lot of commode rejection. Uh, the shielding adds another layer of, of protection. And if you properly terminate and keep everything clean, yeah, you're in great shape. You don't have to go too too crazy with toroids or do anything funky. Got you. Guys, you know, there's actually a lot more that, that, that we could discuss on this because there's whole, well, there's the whole subject of, of, of how you might run um, uh, uh, you know, grounding bars in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a studio or in a, in a rack room. Um, I guess what brought the, a lot of this to mind was I was at a station uh, of, uh, today, excuse me, a couple of days ago here in Nashville that had fantastic uh, copper bus bar uh, ground system uh, in in the uh, in, in the rack room, and the the uh, uh, and to avoid creating ground loops, this bus bar was um, on the, along the top of the racks, but it was insulated from the racks with high voltage insulators just to hold it sturdy and in, in a good mechanical way and and electrically uh, away from that. Also, the um, the AC power ground was tied into this uh, the station earth ground. Um, they had been able to do that legally with uh, approval from the electrical inspector. And what the, what the result is, is a really good, um, uh, superb quality ground that they can, when they, you tie anything into it, you know that you're not going to be adding any RF to, to your problem. You're going to be dumping the RF interference into the, this ground. And then this ground was very well tied into the transmitter building and the tower and the, and the, the you know, the wires uh, under the ground, the, the, uh, um, uh, the ground rods, the lightning rods, and so forth, so that uh, uh, whether it was the lo the local on-site AM transmitter that uh, that they uh, rent space on their tower to, or whether it was uh, one of their backup transmitters, which are pretty high power, like uh, 10, 12,000 watt uh, backup transmitters, um, they would be able to, uh, they wouldn't have RF interference coming in because they had such a good infrastructure in the plant to tie things to and a lot of their plant uh, well a lot of it's still analog but a lot more of it is AES digital um, and um, uh, so it's, it's less susceptible to the kind of RF interference that would you know would plague us at, at some radio stations heck I remember years ago I, I was I, I was doing some engineering installing a console and unfortunately it was a pretty inexpensive console um, I like to call it a radio instead of a console but it was the, the the place where they chose to build the studio was a room in the radio station that literally was six feet from the AM tower. Uh, you know, why, I don't know why you design a radio station such that the AM tower isn't 60 feet from the building or 160 feet or 600 feet from the building. Why it had to be, you know, why they had to locate the tower and the studio inches from each other is just beyond me. But you can imagine the level of RF in that room uh, was pretty high. It was a thousand watts, maybe it's 500 watt station. It was actually legal from an RF exposure point of view to be in that room, but not by much. And uh, legal or not, it was tough to get a console to work in there at any kind of a, any kind of a reasonable way. Um, any more horror stories like this? I guess we're gonna have to save for for another another episode because we're about out of time. Uh, Chris Tar, you got any last minute uh, uh, advices for us about uh, keeping RF out of our desired audio? Um, you know, other than, uh, you know, the, the grounding issues and the toroids, no. Uh, the only other thing I would mention is if you've got an AM station and you do have a lot of RF around, check the grounding on your AM towers, too. Uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, if, I, I do find, too, that there are some stations with uh, bad antenna systems that cause a lot of RF uh, in, in the near field as opposed to uh, a station that has a good ground system to it. So that may also be something you want to look at if there's a, a huge problem with RF in your facility. Got you. Hey, Mr. Tobin, any last minute uh, things you'd like to add to our conversation? He's muted. Not again. This microphone keeps muting itself. It's not good. 
Uh, just make sure you have those tight connections. Uh, if you're using XLR connectors, make sure they snap into place. And if you're doing shielded cable, make sure the shield is on both ends, connected to the ground and to the connector itself, the shield of the connector. Other than that, just general practice, and you should be in good shape. Gotcha. All right. Well, folks, I hope we've given you a bit of an insight into uh, into RF grounding. There are some some books and manuals written about about grounding and and may having a good station ground. Uh, one of the ways that I learned about this uh, subject and started to be able to take it seriously was actually from uh, the a, a manual or a supplement to the manual that came with a Nautel brand transmitter. Uh, the subject there was more about keeping lightning out of your transmitter and keeping it from blowing up. Uh, but that kind of, of uh, heavy-duty infrastructure for grounding is really helpful when you're trying to solve uh, uh, other grounding or other you know, RF interference problems. Um, but the good news is, hey, I really believe that we're in a better place. It's easier now to get rid of these problems than because of digital, uh, because of AES and, and Ethernet. It is a bit easier to, to get rid of this. I guess one more, one more point about this. I was visiting uh, WOWO, W-O-W-O, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they were putting in uh, an IP audio system there, and they we used um, uh, on the longer runs, you know, from the rack room out to each studio. Rather than using uh, copper twisted pair cable for the Ethernet runs, they used fiber. So they were, had you know no RF pickup whatsoever on those fiber runs, and then they'd have an Ethernet switch uh, in each studio, and then a, a, a core switch, if you will, uh, back in, in the central rack room. And uh, uh, so they're obviously, all their long runs, uh, they didn't have any antennas there. You know, they, they, had, uh, they had fiber runs, which don't act like antennas whatsoever. Hey guys, we've got to give away a prize. Uh, it's our weekly giveaway. We give away uh, a license, a, a copy of Omnia AXE, which is software that runs on a PC as a service. It's good, reliable stuff. I like it, runs at all my radio stations. And um, it uh, it does audio processing on your incoming uh, audio, and then it will encode it uh, as MP3, AAC, uh, HEAC V2. As our friend Greg Oganowski says, is the best thing out there to uh, to stream to to listeners at reasonable bit rates. So we're going to give away uh, an Omnia AXE license. And uh, let's see, how about uh, Mr. Tobin? I need a number between one and oh, let's say uh, eighteen. Nineteen. I'm sorry, seventeen. 17, 17. I'm going well, to count backwards from the end. And all right, we have a winner. Uh, oh, my gosh, I know, I know this guy. This, 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 could, <laughs> this, could be, uh, this could look like impropriety in a giveaway. Uh, but no, this, this was this num number 17 in the list here. Stephen, Stephen Wilkinson uh, of uh, Hope 103.2. In Australia, you know, with a with a 103.2, you know, it's not the U.S. Hope 103.2. Stephen Wilkinson, congratulations! You are the winner of Omnia AXE. And uh, Stephen, uh, get in touch with me, and I will um, make sure you get your your license and your download instructions. Hey, thanks uh, to all of you who uh, retweeted. The, the announcement that the show was starting. We appreciate that very much. And we really have built a, a bigger base of listeners thanks to your efforts. And um, uh, we've given away, I think, about uh, 15, uh, 12, 15 copies or so of Omnia AXE. Oh, thanks for the kind words from uh, 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 Bogo Interactive uh, about how much he's loving his Omnia AXE. Sure appreciate those kind words. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up here. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, has been brought to you by uh, Axia Audio on the web at axiaaudio.com. Thanks very much to Burke back in Petaluma, California, for uh, switching and, and our show and making us kind of look like uh, reasonably intelligent people, uh, correcting <laughs> our mistakes and making us look all pretty. Burke, thank you. And thanks to Chris Tarr in Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Appreciate you, buddy. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's always good to be had. And thanks also to Chris Tobin from New York City. Thank you very much, Chris, for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. All right, hope to see you guys uh, not next week. We're off next week, but we'll see you the week after that. Uh, I've got some good guests coming along. I'm gonna, I'm, I don't know if I should promote them or not because you know, we just never know exactly which week they're going to make it on, but we do have some good guests coming up. Thank you for listening and participating in uh, This Week in Radio Tech. We'll see you later. Bye.